Professor Dr. Leopold Anna is a graduate of Ecole de Hautes Etudes Commercials and, and McGill University, PhD 1994 in Canada. Dr. Dana is a research professor at Montpellier Business School and Mary Curry Fellow at Princeton University. He formerly served at the University of Canterbury and prior to that as a visiting professor of entrepreneurship at INSEAD in SED and deputy director of the International Business MBA program at Nanyang Business School in Singapore. He has published 36 books as well as 270 peer-reviewed articles, mainly in the area of economics development, entrepreneurship and issues of island economies. His work has appeared in a variety of leading journals including the British Food Journal, Colonel Quarterly, Entrepreneurship and Regional Development, Entrepreneurship, Theory and Practice, International Small Business Journal, Journal of Small Business Management, the Journal of World Business and Small Business Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Leopold Dana. Thank you for the very warm and very kind welcome. Now I know more about me than I thought I knew. Uh, my friends, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, to the organizers, a very special thank you for organizing what I think is an amazingly wonderful event and great opportunity to meet people, like-minded people, to brainstorm and to exchange ideas. Um, and so um, I appreciate this opportunity to be with all of you. I thought today would be interesting to speak about research. You're all researchers. And when you go to the library, you see that in the quantitative journals, quantitative research is testing hypotheses. It doesn't create new theory. It tests <coughs> stuff which we think about. But how about advancing theory? How do we come up with new theory? For new theory, it's not large sample sizes and it's not quantitative studies. It's qualitative. And so quantitative is great to test hypotheses and qualitative is great to contribute to theory. But the problem is that most people write qualitative papers and get them rejected. Because it's really, really, really hard to get a qualitative paper accepted. And so I thought I'd share with you a bit today on how to, how to be a winner. So there are many methodologies and there are many methods. Does anybody here know the difference between a methodology and a method? Sometimes they're used erroneously as synonyms but they're not the same thing. Methodology is a way of doing research, and the method is a way of getting data. Very important not to confuse those. So I thought I'd go over um, a few of these, and we could learn as we go, and anytime you have any questions, feel free to ask. We can make it as interactive as you like. So my first question is, what is qualitative research? You can answer, it's research that attempts to contribute to theory building. But that's not enough. What else? Well, qualitative research is a type of scientific research focused on holistic inquiry from the participant's viewpoint with rich descriptive detail from observing subjects in their natural setting. It's not about sending an email and asking you, do you like blue or green, and people say green. Because you can tell me that you like green to make me happy, but if I see that in fact you prefer blue, but you just say green to make me happy, I call that socially desirable responding. And there's literature about that. Because 
Well, you can say that people lie, or you can say that people are just polite. So, I can cook for you my favorite food. Um, if I cook my favorite food, my wife doesn't like it. But she makes pretend to be polite and it's tolerable. But she can't even eat it because she thinks it's terrible. And so, social desirable responding is a problem in quantitative research, but in quantitative we go around and find other ways of getting correct answers from people in their own words. It's never a multiple choice or a yes, no, hi, do you prefer red or green? It's more, I like to watch you paint. I notice you use a lot of green and no blue. How come? Tell me about it. Right there, perfect example of qualitative research. What's the problem with it, though? It takes time. If I ask you the question, do you like red, do you like blue? Very easy. You tell me red or blue, maybe you lied, but it doesn't matter. It's fast. But if I have to give you colors and watch you paint and then analyze how much paint you use so that I figure out which color you like, it's going to take time. And that's why very few people want to do this, because you want to get a publication fast. And sometimes a self-publication has its merits, too. So let's go for it. The characteristics of qualitative research, well, reasons why I like it. Clifford Geertz spent some time in Indonesia. And he used the term thick description. It's not about fast answers. It's about people telling their story. They tell, and then they tell, and then you listen, and you ask more. We also emphasize that qualitative research is deep, and we emphasize the adjective holistic. Let's go back one step. What's methodology? Well, methodology is a plan of action involving a structured set of strategic guidelines to assist researchers in scientific inquiry. And adherence to methodology results in structured and coherent procedures. Now, you're welcome to take pictures as much as you like, but if you're really interested, I can give you all this for a journal article. Would you like that? Okay, is there a way that I can get an article to all of you? We can post it on our page. You can put it on the page? Yeah. All right, so if you teach me how it goes on the page, I'll give you the PDF, okay. and this way everybody can have all of this in an article. Because to make this presentation, I sat by the article, and I read and read the article again and again to make the presentation. <laughs> so if you have the article, it's easy for you. So you can have both. And so when you have a methodology and you adhere to it, the fact that it's structured is very helpful. So I promise you we're going to look at some of them, because if we look at all of them, we'll be here until next week. And so we're going to look at some of them. And I picked a few that are relevant to management, because if you're studying mice in the laboratory, uh, you might be interested in different ones. I don't think many people here are studying rats in the laboratories. So I, I try to pick stuff that's interesting for you. One which people try to use, and very often completely wrongly, is the case study. Case study is very useful to learn about, and we will. Another one is the critical incident. It happens less often, but in some organizations it can be very fun. Ethnography. Oh, can we keep the door open, please? Because it brings in some warm air. Yeah, please, if you keep open, I bring some warm air. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some of you have written some of my work that I've done uh, with the Eskimo, with the Sami. Um, that's ethnography. Um, when I go and sit in Lesotho for six months with a family, that's called ethnography. And we'll look at it. There's also field stimulation. And there's grounded theory, which is very funny. Because many people like to say that they use it, but they're not using it. 
but it's, it's very trendy to say I use it even though you don't. And, and it's better to say you use it when you use it, or not say you use it when you don't use it. But when you make pretend to say you use it and you don't use it, then often the, the reviewer is going to be critical. And we'll look also at, at a few data collection methods. The methods I suggest to look at are the Delphi. Delphi is, is very respected and very fun to use. Document analysis, something I use often. Focus groups, especially uh, useful when you're in a business context. Interviews and observation and participant observation. Very interesting to distinguish between observation and participant observation. Observation means I just watch you. But what happens if I watch you? If I watch you and you see me watching you, then you might not do what you do usually. Right? Uh, if, if you're on the bus and there's a guy picking his nose and you look at him, suddenly he doesn't pick his nose as much. <laughs> Have you all seen that? Okay, well, it's just, we see this everywhere. Participant observation, I just examined a PhD about that. A girl went and spent 12 months in a marketplace in Ghana selling fruit. Not because she wanted to sell fruit. Why did she spend 12 months doing a PhD selling fruit? Because by making pretend that she's there to sell fruit, she can watch the other fruit sellers. If she comes with her camera, the fruit sellers won't behave the same way. But if she sits with them on the ground and she sells fruit, then people tell her, ah, there's a tourist there, you can charge him double. As opposed to when she comes like a tourist and they want to charge her double. So, hi, I'm a tourist. Can you tell me about selling fruit? Oh, you know, I make very little money. Hi, I want to sell fruit. Do you think it's good? Oh, sell fruit. I can show you how to make a lot of money. So, the same people will tell you different stories depending on, on what you promise. So, now we know a little bit about uh, qualitative research about methodologies and about methods. So my question now becomes, how are qualitative methodologies different than positive quantitative methodologies? And that's something that you might want to address sometimes in your methodology section of your paper. Essentially, the two types principally differ in the way they define and appropriate reality. I can ask you the question, do you prefer red or do you prefer blue? Or I can ask you, is red better or is blue better? Blue better. Blue better. Blue better. Blue better. But you see, the difference is in the color. Is it better or is it your preference? So that's the trick. So quantitative research attempts to remove the investigator from the investigation. We use large sample sizes and we find causal variables. And it's very good for testing hypotheses. And that's the majority of articles we see in the library, and they get published relatively quickly. Some get cited, some get forgotten, some don't even get read. Now, the objective of inductive qualitative methodology is to develop theory. It's not to test hypotheses, it's to develop theories. And so the researcher begins with what they say in Latin, tabla haza, no hypotheses. Open-ended questions allow to record quotations and to describe from the perspective of the participant. So, 
Has anybody heard of a group called the Lemurs? Pardon? The Lemurs. The Lemurs are a minority in Karachi, but they're very represented in business. How come a small percentage of people have a big percentage of business? And how come self-employment is so high among them, more than everybody else? And how come they don't go to school very much? You have a PhD? They don't. But they have businesses. How does that work? Ideas? Well, maybe they are much focused on business only. Maybe they what? They are much focused on business only. Absolutely. But why? Very early in, the kids are being born. They educate their children. Yes. And they learn how to do that. Yes. And we and there's a term for that which is called cultural capital. And cultural capital differs depending on which family somebody grows up in. In my family, we ate rice. My wife's family, they ate potatoes. My wife doesn't know how to cook rice nor how to eat rice. And, and I, if I stay a long time without rice, then I'm suffering because I need rice. But that's, that's cultural. It's not, I go to school and study. As of tomorrow, I'm going to start liking rice. This doesn't work for that. It's not, as of tomorrow, I'm going to like being business. It's as a very young age, you watch your uncle, you watch your... And then since you have people in business to watch, but you don't have people in university to watch. So, you want to do a PhD? No, 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 it's how one, what should I? And so, much of what people do is directed by those childhood encouragements. Or we can say encouragements, or we could say discouragements. Because if all my uncles are in business, I'm discouraged to become a dentist. Why should I spend all day in somebody's mouth when, oh, my friend, can you keep it open, please? <laughs> and so open-ended questions allow you to study concepts such as cultural um, issues, such as social issues, um, anything that's non-financial capital. You ask people, um, you know, you could go to university. How come you're selling stuff? And then they tell you in their own words, and then you understand. Sometimes we may say ethical issues as well. Pardon? Ethical issues as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, ethical issues, religious issues, political issues. Um, they're very, very difficult to discuss politics with people. Um, but if people talk, they'll tell you stuff. And so I like open-ended questions because you record the quotations and you find it in their words. If I tell people, do you want an apple or a pear or a peach? Well, you're limiting them to those. But if you ask me, what fruit do you want? I don't say apple. I say guava. Or I say uh, passion fruit. Um, or I say durian. But that wasn't the choice you gave me. So let somebody tell you in their own words what they want. McDonald's like to ask people, hi, do you like the meat with the cheese or the meat without the cheese? Well. How about if I'm vegetarian? You didn't give me that option. And so what I'm suggesting, ask people to tell you in their own words, and they'll tell you, I don't eat meat. Oh, I didn't know that. And then it opens new stories. Now there's also interest in a deductive research which is qualitative as well. And it starts, like quantitative research, with the construction of a conceptual model. You do that from the theory, 
And that can be used to prepare the data collection and data analysis. Very useful for a younger PhD candidate with less, with less experience. Um, very useful for uh, somebody going into a field that's very new to them. So, remember I told you earlier that different people have different ideas at how the world works. And so, let's look at how the world works. The positive tells us that reality is only one. Is it dark or is it, light or is it bright? Well, how many people think it's bright here? How many people think it's dark here? So is it dark or is it bright? Or is it relative to something else? Right? <laughs> so, um, the positives tell us that there is um, there's one reality, and uh, they're out to study that one reality, and they are always right because they have the scientific reality, which in some cases you can find. You can you can find that um, acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. We resolve that. Newton told us that F equals MA. We resolve that. We have the standard equations of, of attraction, GM1, M2 over R squared. We don't know all that stuff. But what happens when Einstein introduces the concept of being at a faster than normal speed? Suddenly, Newtonian physics doesn't work. So it's very nice to, to say that there is one truth but there is a limit to a truth. Uh, people used to say, the more people you know, the more likely you're going to do business. Remember? And then a couple of years ago, I did the article and I said, depends who you know. It's not just a matter of numbers, it's a matter of... Exactly. Exactly. So we went to Alaska, and we interviewed people, and we found the more friends they had, the less likely they were to be in business. Because in their culture, I can't sell to friends. I can't accept money, so I get free. So if I have too many friends, then there's no business. So the more friends I have, the less likely I am to be in business. In New York, I can have a thousand friends. There's still 20 million people. They can be my customers. But if I live in a town in Alaska where there's 120 people and 90 of them are my friends, I can't sell to 30 and make a living. I better not have a store. And so those are the types of questions that can be extremely exciting that you can't find from quantitative research. Well. The phenomenological approach disagrees very much with positives. They'll tell you there are multiple realities. One can be um, uh, relative to something else. And so, um, the relative to something else are social, um, psychological constructions, and they're interconnected. So, um, are you happy? Well, it depends. Uh, when you went to your wedding, you were happier. But um, when, when you were uh, sad, you weren't as happy. So it's not just, are you happy? Yes, no. It's, it's uh, a relativity. And so realities can be understood as, as the thinking of those who want to understand. Another thing that's very important is the relationship between the knower and the known. If you look at, at physics, for example, um, if you identify where a molecule is, the fact of seeing the molecule is because a photon bounces off of it. Well, the weight of the photon makes it move. 
So it's no longer exactly where you saw it. And so the act of seeing something makes it no longer where you saw it. And that's in physics. Imagine in social sciences how it is. And so here, our second point is to emphasize the relationship between the, the knower and the, um, the seeker of the knowledge. The positives tell us that the knower can stand outside what's to be known. I stand outside and I watch and I know objectively what's going on. The other school says, no, 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 no. They're interdependent. I think I understand, but in fact, I haven't understood the whole thing as I get into it. And by getting into it, I've changed it. Number three, remember we spoke earlier, my friend, about the, the, the cultural values when you see your uncle and you grow up and you learn things from being very young. Well, what role do values play in understanding the world? The positive said, well, I can study something value-free. <coughs> Think, how often can you really study something value-free? It's hard, isn't it? And so the other school tells you that values mediate and shape what is understood. And so whereas once upon a time the positive approach seems so easy, when we think about it, we realize, wait a minute, it's not so easy. There are other ways to look at it that might be better. So something to think about. Number four. Are causal linkages possible? Well, the positives tell us that an event comes before another event. And so if, if I trip on my shoelace and then I fall, the causal variable of why I fell is because I fell on, as a result of falling on the uh, tripping on the shoelace. However, if somebody has a shoelace, and they don't trip on it, and they have a heart attack, and they fall, and they die. Can you say the guy died because he had his shoelace not tied? It's a coincidence. It's not because the shoelace came off first, therefore he died. But sometimes he can fall on it. And so, events shape each other. And you can have multi-directional relationships. It's not because something happened first that it caused the second thing. Sometimes something happens before, and something else happens that's completely unrelated to it. Number five, what's the possibility of generalization? And that's very important when you submit to a journal, because journals want generalizations. You can write a beautiful story about this is the, the store um, on the corner of the street and, uh, and they did this and they succeeded very well. So what? Is it an exception? Is everybody doing it like that? Is it a guarantee to success? If all you're doing is telling us the story, that's not academic research, that's journalism. And that's very good. You can put it in the Singapore Times, you can put it in the New York newspaper, you can put it in the Toronto newspaper, but it doesn't go in the journal. So I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying that an academic journal is not a good match for something that's not academic and scholarly in nature. So that's something to think about. So, um, IJESB, um, is extremely well ranked because it accepts 5% of the submissions. In other words, 95% of the submissions are rejected. And that's how it's well ranked. It publishes 96 papers a year. That's 5%. Imagine if we published 100%. And that's 
then the fail would be serious anymore. The reason it's respected is because it's selective. So I spend a lot of time writing to people and explaining to them, you know you've got a really good story, but it doesn't fit in the journal. And, and sometimes somebody says to me, um, is it because you don't like Canada that you don't accept my paper? Is it because you don't like, well, it's not a matter of liking or not liking. It's a matter that some things will fit and some things will not fit. If the shoe is made in China and it doesn't fit me, it's not because I don't like China, it's because I don't like a shoe that's too small. If the shoe that's made in Ghana is bigger, then I buy the shoe that fits me. Doesn't mean I like Ghana more than China, it means I like the shoe that fits me. But people will invent a story that, ah, oh, you prefer Ghana than China because you bought their shoe. Well, no, I would buy anybody's shoe as long as it fit me. And it's the fit that's the most important. So always try to remember the analogy of the shoe and if it fits. And many journal editors will have a hard time sometimes convincing you you have a really good paper, but it's not the fit. And they don't dislike you. It's just the fit isn't right. You like me? <laughs> Imagine I give you some shoes that are the wrong size. Will you wear them? Why? I'm a nice guy. <laughs> you see, the, the fit is very important. So, the positivists tell us that explanations from one time and place can be generalized to other times and places. And sometimes they can. If we use the right terms, if we say that the more friends you have, the more business you have, well, maybe in New York, yes, but not in a small town. The other school tells us that only tentative explanations for one time and place are possible. So you have a section in your paper that speaks of limitations. The limitations. This works very well for JB, but in Singapore it's different because Singapore has different laws, etc., etc., etc. Number six, what does research contribute to knowledge? The positive tell us that generally it's a proof of propositions. So your paper is you have hypotheses and you test the hypotheses. And sometimes you think, gee, this is really boring to write this. Is that right? And sometimes it's really boring to test it. And sometimes it's really boring when you have to proofread it. Am I right? And sometimes the reviewer finds this also very boring. So if you find it boring and you wrote it, imagine the reviewer who has to read it, who not even paid to do that. So often I get a reviewer writing and says, hi, thank you for uh, having me to be a reviewer. I read until page three and I fell asleep. <laughs> so please reject it. Other times I get, thank you for uh, I tried to review it, but I don't understand it. You have people who write something in Burmese or something, and they translate word for word on, on uh, some program, and, and the syntax is something that you completely don't understand. You know, um, me, small English, you understand. It means I don't speak English very well. But sometimes you get a combination of words, um, if, uh, if frog, uh, a tree big. Uh, but in the page four, you wonder, is this a business journal? Now, don't forget, sometimes the reviewer doesn't speak English as a native tongue. So if you do something with a lot of errors in it, you're going to frustrate the hell out of them. I'll give you an example. When I was a student, I had to take, we had compulsory courses to take. One of the compulsory courses was called marketing. We used a book called Marketing in Canada. It was written by my teacher, whose name was Michel Laroche. And uh, half the class thought this is a fantastic book. And half the class thought this is a terrible book. And, and half the class failed. 
And they said, we don't understand anything because the teacher teaches with a French accent and the book is terrible. And of course we fail because we don't understand anything. And the other half of the class did very, very well. We said, this is the best book we ever read. Can anybody guess what the story was? Michel Laroche wrote a book in French. He translated it word for word into English with French syntax. So if you spoke English, you couldn't understand anything. But for the half the class who spoke French, and if it were a good book, it's no headache. Because the English book was very hard for me, but this book was English words, but French syntax, so this was really good. So of course I got a hundred on the exam. But then when I changed the when I changed the book, I was really unhappy. Because then I had to know English. <laughs> so what does research contribute to knowledge? I think you got the point. Qualitative methodologies, I think, are fun, but they're not easy, and they have problems. The limits in the scope, they take a lot of time, a lot of patience. Generalizability is compromised. They're extremely labor-intensive. It's not SPSS. It's listening to tapes for hours and typing for hours and hours and hours. If you say, hi, I have a study, I've got 64,000 questionnaires to send, I want some money, it's going to take a week to do, you get the money. If you say, hi, I want to go sit in the Susu for a year to watch how, um, as a funder, you think twice. Do you want to give this money to go sit somewhere for a long time like that? So funding is a challenge. And uh, the human person is the primary collection tool, and so there's an issue with uh, subjectivity. And again, culture is important. What you're saying about culture? Because um, in my family, uh, we have a plate of rice, and you eat every rice on the plate. If you don't eat it, it's a lack of respect. It shows you're not a good cook. It's a lack of appreciation. It's wasteful. It's snobism, and it's not nice. One time I went to a family, and they said to me, you finished your food, you must be very hungry. Yeah. I, said, I said, no, I finished, thank you. So they put me some more. And I said, no, I don't want to waste it. And they said, no, you must leave some in your plate to show that you're not hungry. But that made me feel very uncomfortable because I don't like to put food in the garbage. Another one is, um, sometimes you go to somebody's house and you take off your shoes. And one time I went to somebody's house and I took off my shoes and they started screaming. They said, who died? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Why did you take off your shoes? Well, because out of respect for your floor, I don't want to dirty it. But in their custom, they take off the shoes only when somebody dies. And by taking off my shoes, it means I wish somebody would die. <laughs> so often, um, you make a mistake without knowing you're making a mistake. So some qualitative methodologies. The case study, which is overused and often incorrectly used. The critical incident, ethnography, which takes a lot of time, but which is very rewarding, field stimulation, and the ground of theory, which I explained to you earlier, many people talk about it as if they understood, but they don't know what they're talking about. What's the case study? Have you read Robert Yin? Have you heard of Robert Yin? Okay, well don't do a case study until you do. Robert Yin, very important in case studies. 
Yin, Y, I, N. Barbara Yin tells us that a case study is a detailed investigation of a social unit, which could be an entrepreneur or a firm or family business or a good corporation. Could be one airline, could be an alliance of airlines. Why do we have a case study? Because we want to describe something, and if we have a multiple case study, we might be able to find a pattern, and we might be able to say something about theoretical implications. The focus of the case study is on understanding the subject and variables relevant to it, but not necessarily on generalization. I'm not looking to explain everything everywhere. I'm looking to explain just what happens in this scenario. Many journals don't like that. Because the top eight journals tend to like generalizability. Something that's essential in case studies is a, a case protocol. A list of questions so you know what you're going to study. Uh, like an interview, uh, you like to know what you're going to ask. Very embarrassing, you have an interview with somebody, hi, what do you want to talk about? I don't know, did you have a nice day? <laughs> so if you have your questions in advance, then uh, by asking them, you can get some answers, you can think ahead at more questions, and you can have a very, very um, educational, intellectual discussion. Why are they useful? Well, conclusions are very valid for comparable cases. If I find that when such and such happens, the business is successful, then I take from it, we should do the such and such at least to success. Or to avoid the problem that caused the failure. Remember, a group can be a company. Um, you, can you can define your units as you go along. The critical incidence technique, which I mentioned earlier, um, very, very under-researched in journals, extremely exciting. It's a methodology that obtains a record of specific behaviors from those best in the position to make necessary observations and evaluations from it. So, um, some people from your board design. That's a critical incident. You get the information from people who are very close to it, and you try to find out why there's so many people resigning. What are we trying to get to? So the focus is a critical incident, but what does it mean? Well, an incident is, a, is an observable act that's complete in itself, such as to permit inferences and predictions to be made about a person who's an act. For example, somebody resigning from CEO, somebody getting off the board, somebody um, um, organizing some embezzlement in the company or in the government. Um, something that you can actually see is critical because it's visible and identifiable. To be critical, the incident must occur in a situation where the purpose of the act seems fairly clear to the observer and where its consequences are sufficiently definite to leave little doubt about its effects. So the dependent variable is very important. Dependent variable is always important. But in this case, you want to focus on um, a critical incident when you could awaken or trace your intuition. So let's do that now together as an exercise. The dependent variable is the use of intuition. Was there ever that uh, intuition made an important role in your life? Yes, please tell us. Whenever uh, most of my decisions I make in my life are based on this. I think you make very good decisions. Somebody else. Yes, please. Yeah, it, it happens, but it's 
not subjective, but not, not quite often, like your intuition leads you to make a decision, but yes, it does happen timely. And, and you can notice it, you remember it, you remember it. And so you can think about it. Uh, what was it about? What did you do? Were others involved? What was their role? How did you trace it? How did you bring intuition into practice? Ask yourself, do you think that intuition is a mind-related phenomenon, or is it according to you beyond the mind, just related to deeper conscientious levels in use? My favorite is ethnography. Ethnography involves living with people, eating with people, listening to people, and being one of them. Not, I come, hi, can you tell me about your company? But rather, I like to work in your company so I can see what's going on. I had a professor. How did he do his PhD? He went to work in a manual labor factory. And uh, he learned the swear words. He learned how to lie to the boss. He learned how to come late. He learned how to leave early. He learned how to cheat on holidays, uh, uh, leave. He learned how to make pretend to be sick. Hi, can you tell me how you cheat? Hi, I'm working here. You know, I'm really tired of this job. And you, know, you don't have to come tomorrow. Actually, I do. If you're one of the group, you learn things much better than if you come like a tax inspector asking people questions. Ethnography is a study by prolonged field experience with the researcher immersed in the daily life of the observed. It could be in a company, it could be in a society, it could be um, in a school. It's, it's originated in anthropology, and its purpose was to describe the cultural characteristics of a group and to describe the cultural scenes. The researcher is the research instrument. It's not limited to survey or interview, because in a survey, you can answer with a mistake. In an interview, you can lie. But if I'm there every day watching, then I see stuff. Hi, what color do you like to wear to work? Oh, I wear blue every day to work. But if I work with you every day and you never wear blue, then I can tell which color you really wear to work. What's essential in ethnography? is for the researcher to become immersed in every day of the observer. It's not a matter of looking from afar. It's a matter of being there and waiting for the bus together and um, going to drink tea together. And if I ask somebody, how much sugar do you put in your tea? They go, you know, I'm very health conscious. I don't use any sugar. Then you go with them, and they're there putting more and more and more sugar you see, the story they told you doesn't correspond to what you see. And ethnography allows you to see the research as opposed to just reading or listening to it. A very useful, Glazer and Strauss and later Denson emphasized on ethnography in developing and testing theory. So for journals, it can be really cool. Examples? Well, my PhD was ethnographic. Because I made a mistake of doing it in Canada. And in those days, there was no email. So we had to go to the photocopy machine and put 10 cent sheets for the copy. We made four copies and find an envelope big enough and then walk all the way to the post office and then weigh the envelope and then buy the stamps and then print the stamps and then mail it. And maybe six or seven months later, you get an answer by mail. 
So you open the envelope, and it said, you did really interesting stuff. We're a serious journal. We don't publish about Canada and other insignificant countries. Goodbye. So what did I do? That was the serious journal. <laughs> now there's many journals. In those days, we didn't have the luxury. So I took my same questions, and I went to the United States, and I asked the same questions. And I found the same things. I asked people from the big city, why are you an entrepreneur? And they said, because I like to work hard. I like to control others. I like to have lots of money. I like to have lots of power. I have to tell people what to do. Then I asked the indigenous people, why are you self-employed? They said, well, you know, if I work for somebody, it's too much risk, I can get fired. So I better have my own job. And I don't need a lot of money, so I don't work a lot. I work a bit, and the rest of the time, I go hunting and fishing. I found the exact same things in America. Suddenly it was okay. Uh, and so my theory building, I showed that entrepreneurship was a function of culture. Uh, sometimes people think that entrepreneurship is a function of money. But I give you an example. Uh, would you rather I give you a ringgit or I give you a New Zealand dollar? New Zealand dollar is worth more if you're going to New Zealand. If you're going to take the New Zealand dollar and go to the bank and try to change it, they don't take the coin. So your New Zealand dollar is worthless, actually. So the ringgit you can spend in Malaysia is worth more. But in theory, if you're going to New Zealand today, then the dollar is worth more. What am I telling you? Is that your reasoning is not only financial. New Zealand dollar is worth more than a ringgit. But after you pay the commission to change it on one dollar, and they don't take coins anyway, well, it's a lost cause. So do I rather have a dollar that's more, that's useless, or a ringgit that's, I can buy something with it? And so um, the opportunity depends on who I am, where I am, where I'm going, what I'm going to do with it. And much of that, in the case of entrepreneurship, is culturally based. 2007, I did a, a very tiring ethnographic study. I went to live with an Amish family. You know the Amish? And the Amish are, are very wealthy entrepreneurs in America. Uh, they, don't, they have no cell phone, no TV, no electricity, uh, no hot water. <coughs> Um, no car, they don't take the MRT, they don't take the bus. Um, and they farm with horses. They wake up before sunrise, uh, they pray in German, and uh, then they go milk the cows. And after that, um, then you can have breakfast. And so I agreed to go and milk cows so I could learn about how they do that. Very, very hard, but, but interesting. And I learned from them that profit is not the primary motive for entrepreneurship. So in terms of data collection methods, remember I told you earlier that um, you can participate or not? And there's advantages to participating. Uh, so here I, I did a lot of work with the Sunday people. Um, uh, these people are busy working. <laughs> and, and if you send them an email, they're not going to get it. And to say, hi, can you stop and, and answer the question, they're not interested. So the only way you're going to write about them is to sit there and, and have your hands full of blood up to here and mud up to here and watch what's going on. So, ethnography yeah, can be dirty.
And sometimes the animals kick you. Um, but that's usually the young ones, so that's all right. So data collection methods, observation and uh, participant observation. The observer systematically seeks out and organizes data. We're not focusing on achieving a one goal. We're looking at the records and learning from them. Because in fact, qualitative research is really about learning. Observations are closely monitored for evidence of bias. The moment you say, oh, oh, um, I don't like this, or this isn't fun, or this is dirty, that's a bias. You're supposed to be there observing, not judging. This isn't supposed to be fun. Rather than simply observe, the participant observer actively participates in what's going on. Very, very important to be one of the group and not just the combatant. Um, I hope I motivated you a bit. And if you have questions, um, we can do some questions today, tomorrow, next week, and next month, whatever you like. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your attention. And I'm at your service. Yes. That's good. Can, can we use the ones with variables, variables uh, doesn't have theory in the Absolutely, that becomes a good study. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, how we can the collaborate about the grand theory, needle, and apply it, apply it to theory? Uh, by the literature your literature review should be relevant. And, and guide the reader into what you're going to get to. And then in your conclusion, you show the relationship of how you contribute to the literature. The literature says that one, two, three, five, six, seven, and you invented four. And now, because of you, we have one all the way to seven, including four, because you invented four. So that's a good study. The problem is when when you don't find something new. Yeah. Uh, uh, the novel thing you say uh, for one research we can learn uh, something new, right? This is yeah. a novelty called. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, one paper is uh, have a uh, combination uh, from one theory for uh, Mr. A and one theory for Mr. B. Can can we can of uh, course this is a uh, uh, new theory of our research? Absolutely. And it's good. Is it a, a novelty of us? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question. Would you be so kind to open the door? Would you say yes? Yes, I'm going to Thank you. Can I help her with the mic? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, if I do the interview, I mean, uh, if I do the interview, do I need to record? Yes. Uh, but for example, if I interview some people, I said I will record to every step, then he will feel nervous. So I think sometimes he will be reluctant to answer some questions, and uh, he will <laughs> not answer. Yes. Totally. Yes. So in that case, what should we do? Um, sometimes they don't tell you the whole story if they're being taped, huh. but more likely, if they're not being taped, you don't remember the whole story. And so um, the, the guy said he had 573 employees or 537, I don't remember. So you write in the article, I interviewed this man and he had or 537 or 573, but I mixed up. So the, the reviewer is going to say, please buy a tape recorder. <laughs> 
because sometimes uh, the respondents doesn't want me typing what the uh, question of for us and to them. Yeah, well, that's that's a problem of questionnaires, and that's where ethnography is much better in that. You don't rely on him saying 537 or 573 or forgetting or remembering. You're there, you can count them. Yeah. You saw the guy with his reindeer? Mm. If you ask him how many reindeer he has, he never answers you. In his culture, he's not allowed to tell you. I can ask him what color underwear he wears, that's okay. And I can't ask him how many animals he has. So how do I find out? Just count, count, count yourself. <laughs> but have to ask. So this is why I try to introduce you an alternative method that you don't have to rely no on him talking, nor on you taping. If you go to the factory and you spend a day in the factory, you don't have to ask very much. Somebody else? Yes, please. Uh, you discussed about ethnography, so there is a perception that when we talk about action research, yeah. so how different, is it like the action research is a bigger umbrella and eth yeah. ethnography is a part of it? Yeah. Yes, please. Absolutely. So, uh, so, so why is the measuring and judgment tool in this quantitative research? I mean, since we, different people have different inter interpretations, isn't that similar to journalism? So, or, in, or there's no totally no right or wrong in quantitative research? Absolutely. You see, if I read a book, uh, uh, one article or one uh, book um, by Mr. X, uh, country Y, and another article or book by Mr. B, Country Z. The first one says that the country is very good, the second one says the country is very bad. I say beware of the bias because it's not the same guy. What's your name? Uh, Dr. Liu. So if Dr. Liu says that Hong Kong has more of a safe fair policy than Trinidad, I believe you, because you studied both and you can compare both from the same standard. But if, if somebody writes about Hong Kong and somebody writes about Trinidad, how, how do I understand that they're equal? So um, there's a very big room for bias. One way to reduce it is to look at what the same author has written about both countries. You can always find that. Um, so there's safety in, in quantitative because they're numbers. And we say they're numbers, and then we have very, very sophisticated software to, to, to manipulate those numbers. We can come up with beautiful chi-squared and come up with everything. And so it's very, very comfortable to play in, in the quantitative game. And, and many people avoid the qualitative because of what you said. There's so much high risk. You see, uh, I'm an old man, I'm freezing. But I bet you somebody young, he's standing here, he's not freezing. So is it freezing or it's not freezing? Right. It depends. You see, uh, I don't like the cold. If I wanted the cold, I go, I go live in Siberia. I like Malaysian weather, I like the hot. Um, some people, they like the cold. Who's right? Nobody's right. Just, Old man likes the warm, and young man likes the cold. 
You see, there's, there's a lot of room for, for ambiguity. So, Is that a good answer? So, I mean, since different people have different uh, interpretations, so where's the value of it for all this? I mean, uh, as compared to quantitative research, where you have a hypothesis for empirical testing, uh -huh. so qualitative research you have, it is so subjective in nature. So, so how do we, I mean, how do we see the value of that? I mean, as compared to quantitative research? Uh, it's very difficult. That's why people stay away from it. However, how do you come up with a hypothesis to test if you haven't done the qualitative to know what to test? So the qualitative gives you ideas for the hypotheses that later can be quantitatively tested with numbers. Somebody else? Yes. Please. So can we say that uh, if I, I want to relate uh, research with the case study, and I want to compare, and because uh, case studies will start from problem. We will identify the problem first, then we will find out the questions related to, with that problem, and we are looking for the answers. Yes. And that is more close to the objectivity and right to the target. Yes. And we are, um, obviously we are spending less time on it. Yes. Okay. But in research, as he said, he mentioned that if we are having the observations and we are not sure about the biasness and unbiasedness of those observations and we are putting in the hypothesis and we are testing all these things. But yes, we have qualitative and we have quantitative. Qualitative is totally based on the subjective matter. Yes. But am I right that quantitative research is having more portion of the uh, objectivity, yes. but yes, there is the subjectivity as well. Yes, because the response, the responses can have subjectivity. So if, hmm, so if I, I, uh, I just want to uh, know about the importance of the research in the upcoming era uh, in the world, that the people, they should focus towards the case studies or towards the research, because uh, the general phenomenon of the regarding the research is not too much good as compared to the case study because the employers they want the immediate yes, yes, the immediate answers yes. and they want the immediate results of the problems what their organization is facing if, if you're a young researcher looking for a job hmm. you'll get your cv more full with quantitative studies more fast hmm. but, but as a, but uh, now, the, how about mixed method can be combined in quantitative and qualitative? Mixed method is great, however, a journal might take two or three years to give you an answer. <laughs> why? And I speak to many journal editors. Uh, why does it take so long? Because you use a mixed method. And we've got to find referees who are experts in what you've used. Sometimes it'll take two, three years for you to get an answer from the journal. After three years, they say, please make all these changes. And then you send them, and three years later, you get an answer. Meanwhile, your boss says, what have you done in the past seven years? Oh, I did one whole time ethic paper that maybe will be accepted. I risk it. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you so very much, Prof. Another round of applause, please. It's, it's been very educative, and uh, thank you so much. Um, I have to cut, or rather stop the questions here, because Prof. Leopold just came in this morning from New Zealand and he shared with us. One thing with those um, researchers or academicians like Prof. Leopold is once you give them the opportunity, they would want to talk and talk and talk again and again and again. They would want to share for as long as they can, but then we should somehow try to give them some chance to take some rest. So Prof. Leopold, I think uh, you have done uh, I mean, the whole thing is well handled. 
We really appreciate. We thank you so very much. And the fact that we will have him tomorrow morning to present a keynote, and in the afternoon, no, still in the morning, for another strategic uh, forum, 11.30 to 1, Dr. Imran? 11.30 to 1, we'll have a profile call with some other keynote um, speakers sitting in this hall to talk about uh, issues related to research. That's another opportunity, and it doesn't stop there. We also have, will have them in the afternoon, 2 p.m., 2 p.m. until 4. They will be talking to us again on things revolving around research and their experiences, perhaps their success stories. So I, I think we have all the opportunities. Uh, once again, Prof, we thank you so very much, and I would kindly ask you to go on stage as the Director of Connected Asia will be presenting a memento to you, please. Uh, Dr. Imran. Uh, Mr. Hamad, can you help Dr. Imran with the shield, please? The Director of Connecting Asia, Dr. Imran Mohammed Wilson, presenting a document of appreciation to Professor Dr. Neil Paul. Thank you so very much, Prof. See you tomorrow. Uh, this marks the end of today's session. We will have a group picture now. And just um, to remind you, morning, tomorrow morning, we will have the keynotes, which will be from 8. 30 up until 11, and after which we'll have a short break, break out to the parallel sessions while the strategic forum will commence. So for those of you who are not having their presentations during the time of the strategic forum, you can come to this hall and uh, be part of the strategic forum. At the same time for the uh, editorial forum, which will be 2 o'clock, if you do not have your presentations during that time, please come and uh, 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 utilize the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, Prof, uh, a group picture, please. A group picture, please, Prof. Everyone, please. Sorry, lest I forget, I would want to uh, recognize the presence of two other keynote speakers who are here with us this evening. One is Prof. Shabazz, he's just standing beside Prof. Leopold. Professor Muhammad Shabazz is also a renowned uh, researcher. Okay. Uh, Professor Amino Ayuba is also here with us. Prof, are you around? Oh, maybe he went out. Thank you everyone. Uh, see you tomorrow morning, please. Sorry, uh, just to let's try to be on time tomorrow, please, because the keynote is going to start. I mean, the opening ceremony is going to start on time, and um, it's going to end by eleven. So please let's come on time. Register and get into the hall on time, please. Thank you.